It's my pleasure to share this session on mathematical models in epidemiology. Let me first uh, thank Professor João Araújo for the invitation to put together this parallel session at uh, SPM annual meeting. Uh, I should say this, is, was a, this was a challenging task. Uh, in one hand, this is perhaps the moment in time at which mathematicians working on mathematical model, models in epidemiology are more active and visible for the population, but also a little bit more busy than usual. Uh, on the other hand, I could not invite all of those that have greatly contributed to this field, in particular here in Portugal, especially in this context of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so for the participants, please feel free to, to leave your questions to the speaker in the question box. Speakers will address uh, these questions at the end of each talk, if, if we have uh, the time, or in the end of the, the session. So uh, to start, um, we have uh, Gabriela Gomes. Uh, uh, Gabriela uh, is uh, uh, has graduated in Applied Mathematics from the University of Porto and completed her master's and his P her PhD in Mathematics in Warwick. Uh, in 1999, she was awarded the Welcome Research Training Fellowship in Mathematical Biology. And in 2002, she established her independent work, a group at IGC, Institute of Bank and Science, initially supported by a Marie Curie Excellence Grant with a spectrum of projects ranging from fundamental mathematical concepts to management of population and ecosystems health, public engagement in science and development of research infrastructures. In 2015, she moved to Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and in 2020, she became a professor uh, at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Uh, she has published over 70 peer-reviewed research papers in international journals, initially in mathematics and physics, but more recently in biology, ecology, and of course in epidemiology. And she supervised several PhD students, including me, uh, and many postdocs. Uh, today, I think that Gabriele is going to speak on uh, individual variation in susceptibility uh, of exposure in SARS-CoV-2 and uh, how this exposure can uh, lower the herd immunity threshold. So it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event. Uh, the screen is yours, you can. Thank you, Paula. Uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, I believe it's now showing. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, so first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's it's a pleasure to to be doing this talk, and it's a particularly exciting moment for for me on, on uh, to present this. I, I have been working on on uh, COVID modeling since more than a year ago, since almost the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, and I've I must say that I've just grown tired of it. I'm really excited to be probably presenting my last results on, on these and move on to, to a wider variety of, of topics that I'm also interested in and I have to put aside so I could dedicate all my time. Uh, I usually say 200% of my time to COVID. This was much more like a, a a ten um, or was much more than a full time uh, job. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, when the pandemic started, I was moving from Liverpool to uh, Glasgow to take a new position at the University of Strathclyde. So I, I and and and, and I started hearing the news and the concerns about, about the pandemic that was just being uh, recognized. And I, I just got in touch with my former collaborators. I didn't have an established group at the time because I was, I was moving. And I just got in touch with uh, some of my former collaborators, long-term collaborators, and we informally uh, worked together on this. I will, uh, at the end, I'll make, I'll pr make a list of, of Preprint several preprints we have written on these, and you'd be interested if, if you are interested. You can look at that and see the various people that have collaborated at various stages of this work. 
So I, 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 I've been working on um, mathematical epidemiology for more than 200 years now. And it's been over the last 10 years that I've been, uh, I've been really fascinated by how individual variation can, can uh, change the, well, the expected behavior of these mathematical models. And so, uh, so I, I've, I started my, my, my work on compartmental models. Uh, let me just give you an example of a, a, an SEIR model. For example, individuals, are, individuals in the population are compartmentalized into susceptible, those that have not, don't have immunity to the specific pathogen we are interested in. We, ha we have the individuals that have been exposed to the, to the pathogen and are now being infected. And, 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 and then they move to this uh, infected compartment when they have a, a fully uh, established and infectious uh, uh, stage of this, uh, of, of, of this disease. And eventually they are removed from this active system by either developing immunity or unfortunately some die, but for the purpose of transmission, it's the same. They do not no longer affect transmission. So this, this, uh, so this that's, that sort of makes SEIR, which is not here because it's total population minus these three compartments. And this lambda is is, is not a, is, is is a force of infection. So it depends. So it, it's it's a variable. So it depends on infected on the number of infected individuals. Um, actually, here uh, I, I forgot to add the exposed in the models. I'm assuming here. I'm assuming that the exposed individuals also contribute somewhat to transmission. They contribute less than I, but they are already having some contribution to transmission. I should have made here in brackets some parameter rho times e plus i instead of just i. Um, and and that's and, and I introduce here this C of T, which is like a, a contact um, uh, factor. So uh, at, at the beginning, before before we recognize that there is a, a, a new pathogen spreading, our contacts are in normal in what is normal in our normal in a normal society in our normal way of living. But as we recognize that there is a pathogen we start reducing contacts either voluntarily in the, by, uh, or uh, by individuals doing it voluntarily or because it, the, the government imposes um, measures to reduce contacts and try to control the spread of this, uh, of this disease. And, uh, and it, this is denoted here by C of T. So, uh, and, and it has a shape like that, that's, so we have parameterized it this way. We assume that at the beginning of the, the SARS-CoV-2 transmission, that factor was one, we were not reducing contacts. And then uh, the, the, there was a gradual uh, decrease of contacts, so contact rates because, uh, 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 because uh, in, in many, in, in most countries, the governments actually imposed uh, limitations to contacts uh, and and there was a, a period of maximal reductions which I'm calling here lockdown number one so uh, which took place around spring last year and then uh, over the summer in most in, 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 in Europe in, in particular where we are the, the contacts started uh, 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 in increasing again, so measures were gradually lifted, but not completely. Uh, and uh, I leave this with parameters that I will estimate, so I'm not imposing any particular intensity of reduction of contacts, and I'm not imposing the slope for this uh, 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 lifting of interventions. I will estimate the slope in particular. And then there were two... Uh, uh, the lockdown two and lockdown three in winter when we had the, the uh, a big wave of infection in most, uh, in many places, in particular in Europe, which I will focus on here. Um, 
the, the model I'm using is not quite that compartmental model. I introduced this individual variation in susceptibility of exposure to infection. Uh, uh, and this, this is denoted by uh, X. So X is the individual, the node's individual susceptibility or exposure. And the, this, each one of these equations, instead of uh, being just one dimensional is now infinite. So, so the, the, we assume that this, uh, this is given by a, a continuous distribution. I will assume a gamma distribution for, for susceptibility or exposure to infection. And the system is rewritten like that. X is multiplying the respective susceptible um, population. Uh, yes, it's susceptibility factor. And this is, these are the gamma distributions. Uh, so they, they look, just look at the black curves for, I'm assuming that the different coefficients of variation for this gamma distribution. For uh, a coefficient of variation equal one, you have an exponential distribution. For coefficient of variation less than one, you have this kind of bell shape, this cube bell shape. And for um, coefficient of variation greater than one, you have a sort of more skewed uh, distribution. Again, I'm not, uh, I'm not imposing a particular coefficient of variation. So this is actually one of the parameters that I will estimate. So in, in, I will be fitting these models to data and I will be estimating the parameters that the, 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 the main uh, the transmission parameters like the, the R0 for, I will, uh, uh, I will give you the expression for R0. I'll calculate, uh, I'll calculate the transmission, the transmission, transmissibility of the virus. And I will estimate also the, the coefficient of variation. Um, so, so, so the R0 will be the mean transmissibility and the coefficient of variation is how that, modifi how that is modified between individuals. Um, and I, I will also estimate the parameters that determine the shape of the, of the interventions of the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, so in this extended model with, with heterogeneity, the force of infection is now the integral overall, uh, must be integrated over all infected individuals. So in individuals with susceptibility X, can be infected by individuals of any susceptibility. So we need to be int integrate over these, and this is the force of infection. Um, R0 is uh, uh, calculated uh, by uh, classical methods in mathematical epidemiology, and this is the, the expression for R0. And, and another uh, quantity I'm interested in is the herd immunity threshold, which means if you leave the, the epidemic run unmitigated, in other words, with C of t equal one uh, for, for all t, uh, then the herd immunity threshold is the peak of this epidemic curve. So you have this epidemic. So, so it's when, when uh, the, the rate of change in, in the number of exposed crosses from positive to negative. So it's when that rate of change. So, so it's the, the, the peak of the epidemic when instead of growing from then on, you will be, uh, the cases will be decreasing. Um, uh, of course, we have not been able to observe that for this particular epidemic because we have in interventions. So we have mitigations and suppression of the transmission uh, all the time. So uh, we are trying to infer um, what the herd immunity threshold is by uh, separating, by fitting the model to epidemic curve, to, 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 the, to the epidemic trajectories, trying to separate the effect of interventions from the, act, the, 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 the intrinsic, from the parameters that determine the intrinsic dynamics of the virus and have given those, we can calculate herd immunity thresholds depends on R0 and CV, which are the parameters that really, the intrinsic parameters that uh, have to do with the transmission. 
the variable connectivity you have, it's almost the same, but the force of infection is slightly different because now individuals who have susceptibility X are also assumed to, to have infectious effectivity X because they are individuals who are more likely to acquire infection are also more likely to transmit to others because the variation comes from connectivity, not from biological susceptibility. So we rewrite this uh, force of infection and that's what we uh, obtain. The R0 is slightly different um, and the herd immunity threshold is slightly different. So one of our preprints provides all the mathematical derivations for this. And when we plot the, this herd immunity threshold as a function of the coefficient of variation, we get this very sharp decrease in herd immunity threshold as we increase coefficient of variation between zero and one and, 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 and beyond. So, so at the beginning of the pandemic, we were hearing a lot about uh, herd immunity threshold of 70% which is what you obtain if you do the simplest, if you apply the simplest homogeneous model uh, and the formula for R0 is one, uh, the formula for herd immunity threshold is one minus one over R0 and, and for an R0 approximately three, which is what we had for these, we get the herd immunity threshold about 70%. Uh, but but we, and, and I became very interested in these because I realized that very, uh, just a little bit of, of variation would be enough to considerably reduce herd immunity threshold and bring it to much lower levels. And of course, this is very important <coughs> when we are trying to interpret the data that was coming early on. Uh, with the models we can be transformed a little uh, further and actually rewritten in this form, I have to speed up because I'm near the end of my time and I'm only in the introduction of my talk. Uh, and and these, these are the actual the other, the, the, the formalisms we used to do the fittings. So we fitted these to England and Scotland and this is mortality data. And we assume the infection fatality ratio of 0.9%, which we obtained from the literature. And, and, and by fitting this model, we estimated R0 is 3.4 for England and coefficient of variation 1.6. And this would give a herd immunity threshold of 29%. For Scotland, very similar, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so, so Scotland, very similar. We fitted the data until the 1st of February here, which we uh, gathered it's before, <coughs> vac before vaccines started having an effect. Sorry. Um, and sorry, I dropped my mouse. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know what happened. Okay, sorry. And uh, and and then this is uh, uh, what what you'd expect the the because of this uh, with the parameters we estimated, we can we kind of made a projection if if we run the epidemic for a certain time uh, in the future, how big, how, how many more cases do we have until we burn all the susceptibles, until we, we cross the herd immunity threshold and burn all the susceptibles? Because here we have not um, uh, crossed herd immunity thresholds yet by the time, of, based on the data we had used for for our fittings. And, and this is what uh, the, it was left to, 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 to happen in England and in Scotland. There were some ex expected some, some, uh, um, some uh, 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 exit wave after the, the, the uh, so after the interventions have been lifted completely. I, I, it's a shame I don't have time to show you this. Uh, and uh, that was heterogeneous susceptibility model, heterogeneous connectivity, the same. A homogeneous model, we would get much bigger egg, exit waves and the fit was considerably worse. So if you look at the goodness of fit, model selection says that uh, the heterogeneous models are uh, considerably better, in particular the heterogeneous connectivity model. Um, I, I think I'm the, at the end of my time, uh, isn't it, Paula? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay. A little bit 
Yeah, and, and we estimated the herd immunity, the, we estimated the, the coefficient of variation to be around one, between one and two. Uh, so the, what we've gathered, what we think the real, uh, the, 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 the real pandemic is, is in this range in our, in our uh, sort of parameter space. We, we did for the same for Spain and Portugal, but unfortunately I don't have time to, 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 to go through this. And these, these are the preprints we wrote uh, over the past year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gabriela. Sorry, this is quite short time to, to present such, that much work and, and very interesting work. Uh, maybe in the end we have some time to discuss all, all the ideas that are we are going to hear across these this, this presentations and maybe you can come back and explain a little bit further your, some details that uh, you didn't show. Uh, so uh, we don't have any questions yet, but maybe we can uh, have them all at the end. So I'll uh, go through to the next speaker. Uh, so now we have uh, Sophie Mieken, and I don't know if it's the right pronunciation, uh, from London School of, School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, so she's currently a research fellow in real-time modeling of infectious disease uh, outbreaks at the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She has been actively, actively working on uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, at the group of Adam Kucharski and uh, John Edmonds and others um, that have uh, contributed a lot for, to, to, to the knowledge uh, and modeling of, of, of this pandemic. Uh, she is interested in application of mathematical modeling and quantitative methods uh, to support outbreak response, as, as in this case. And she worked previously on, as a consultant for the uh, World Health Organization um, uh, in the 19, uh, 2018 Ebola outbreak. So she had already some experience uh, in outbreaks, and I think this would be a great, a great experience. Uh, but she started a, a little bit more theoretical work uh, after her master's in mathematics uh, at Warwick. She did her PhD on infectious diseases modeling, also at uh, Warwick with Matt Killing. And during his PhD, she looked at the uh, effect of metapopulation network structure on epidemic disease dynamics. Uh, she has already an impressive list of publication and prizes. And I should say that this is a pity that uh, this event is online because I, I, I know that Sophie would have a great time in Portugal according to her known academic interests that include a lot of swimming and water and uh, Portugal will be a great place to, to, to do that. Sophie, I'm pleased that you have accepted my invitation. Please welcome uh, to our meeting and the screen is yours. Great, thank you so much, Paola, for the introduction. And yes, looking forward to hopefully visiting places in person in the future. Um, but thank you so much for the invitation to uh, talk at this parallel session. So as Paola said, I'm gonna talk about um, kind of the main piece of work that I've been involved with um, during the COVID pandemic in the UK, um, which has been looking at making short-term forecasts of COVID-19 hospital admissions at quite a local scale um, in England. So just kind of a bit of context for um, kind of the COVID-19 pandemic, or like the timeline in England specifically, um, because obviously there's quite a lot of variation between country that's hard to keep track of. Um, so after we had the first peak in sort of um, mid-April 2020, so it got down to quite low levels. Um, so this is showing weekly admissions in the whole of England. Um, sort of throughout the summer, June to August, there were some very low case incidents um, and very low hospital admissions. And any outbreaks that did happen were sort of generally localised um, in quite a small geographical area. Uh, but come September, October, Cases began um, 
to increase again, initially in younger age groups, but sort of gradually spreading into older adult age groups. Um, and whilst this began off, uh, began being quite localised, it sort of spread throughout the Midlands and north of England and then gradually into the, um, into the country more generally. So in response to rising admissions at the beginning of November, um, we entered into a national lockdown for four weeks um, for essentially the month of November, after which um, admissions sort of declined slightly. There was quite a lot of regional variation depending on how much admissions had already increased. Um, but sort of as um, restrictions were lifted at the beginning of December with the emergence of the Delta variant, um, admissions began to increase again quite quickly. And we got to a point in late December where admissions were very high and there was a lot of pressure on um, sort of hospitals um, to be able to treat the sort of large number of COVID patients that were seeing, as well as kind of other general healthcare requirements. So on the 6th of January, we went back into um, kind of third lot of national restrictions, which in some form or another have lasted up until now. Um, but as a result of going into quite strict um, lockdown in early January, we sort of saw a peak in cases and admissions in mid-January. So um, just a couple of kind of bit of background points on healthcare in England. So patients generally, but and for COVID-19, are sort of mainly treated at hospitals run by the National Health Service. Um, and what I talked about in the title of my talk, I'm talking about making forecasts for um, NHS trusts. And a trust is basically just a unit of, an organisational unit of the NHS, which comprises a small number of hospitals, generally one to three, in a small geographical area. So sort of serving people uh, nearby. Um, and this map on the right just shows the location of these spread out in England. Um, and as you might expect, sort of around the bigger cities like London, Birmingham in the centre and Liverpool and Manchester in the north. There are more trusts around here just because of higher population density. OK, so now getting on to the kind of uh, aims and kind of what we tried to do for this project. So firstly, we just wanted to be able to make short term forecasts of hospital admissions at quite a local level in England for this kind of period, which covered the second, this kind of increase in admissions and the peak up to um, January. Um, this is kind of useful from just to have an idea about kind of the trajectory of the outbreak in different areas, but also to kind of help with um, planning for kind of bed capacity um, at the NHS trust level. Um, and then kind of the academic question that we were asking is we want to be able to not just make these forecasts, but to kind of evaluate how well these do um, and when certain models might do well and why we think these models might do well. So we can kind of learn something more generally about forecasting um, or forecasting admissions um, in this scenario. Um, so to go into a bit of the detail for the methods, um, I can't obviously go into all the detail because of time, but I'm happy to talk about anything else after. So the data that we used um, is all based on publicly available data, which you can access through um, a couple of our packages that the um, our or my collaborators helped develop. Um, so the main bits are, we have daily COVID-19 hospital admissions um, at the level of NHS trust. Um, cases we expect might be useful in predicting admissions. So we also use daily COVID-19 cases, which are reported by local authority, which is just, again, kind of a small geographical region of England. Um, and then we also have um, up to, I think, September, October time, kind of an estimated proportion of the total COVID um, admissions from a local authority that go to each trust. So some idea about where patients from a geographical area are admitted to hospital. And why do we want to know this? Well, we basically, if we want to be able to use um, kind of some information about cases to forecast hospital admissions, then we want to have these on the same scale. Um, so we can use this kind of third estimate to basically map COVID-19 cases from local authority onto um, kind of NHS trust scale to get an idea about kind of relevant cases in that area. Okay, so 
Um, what do the emissions forecasting models look like? So we fit a number of different models here because we wanted to have, um, firstly wanted to have an idea about kind of what different bits of information might be able to do. Um, but also, which I'll talk about later, we kind of combine these models into an ensemble uh, model, which kind of combines all the information. So we have five models in total, which I'll go into the details in a second. And we fit each of these to each trust individually. There are about 130 trusts in England. So each of those, each of the models are fit individually to the last six weeks of data. And we make a forecast every week from beginning of October, 2020 until the end of January, 2021. And we make forecasts um, 14 days ahead into the future. So try and say what's gonna happen in the next two weeks at each week that we make a forecast. Um, and the forecasts are kind of summarized as a point forecast. It's kind of a best point estimate of where we think it will be, plus some kind of interval to essentially say how, to kind of capture the uncertainty around what we think might happen. And in some of the, um, well, yeah, essentially in some of the uncertainty and we report the 50% and 90% interval forecasts. Um, so what do the admissions models look, look like? So kind of I've labeled this as the not kind of zeroth model because it's, I guess, a very naive model, but kind of a good baseline that you would like to do better than. And this is basically just saying that the, um, our point forecast uh, for the future just is the same as the last observed point. So admissions in the future will look like admissions today. Um, and then our prediction intervals, the interval forecasts are just kind of a cone of um, Gaussian uncertainty that kind of expands as you extend the forecast horizon. So it's very simple, um, but is kind of a good place to start. And so then, then the main models. So the first one, again, is very simple, but like kind of a step up from the baseline. Um, autoregressive time series models which basically don't include, don't include any epi information. They basically just use the last six weeks mm. of admissions to say what might happen about admissions in the future, essentially extending whatever trend has been seen, whether that's increasing kind of flat or decreasing, um, but can't do anything kind of more complex. So if there's a change in say cases because of um, a lockdown or restrictions, the time series model has no information about that. So um, the next model that we use is still quite simple, um, a regression model with a REMA kind of correlated errors, uh, which is good for forecasting. But now this includes um, seven day lagged COVID-19 cases um, as a predictor. Um, so this uses past admissions, but it also uses or well, past cases up to a horizon of seven days um, as well as kind of some forecast of cases when you go um, past that seven day horizon. Um, but this means that we can kind of include some information about where cases are heading in the future. Um, and finally, kind of another relatively standard forecasting model for um, including information about cases is um, some kind of scale convolution from cases to admissions. So basically saying that admissions today are kind of a weighted and scaled combination of the cases from kind of all the days in the past. So some proportion of cases will go to hospital and there will be some delay on that, which we need to estimate, but it comes from kind of a broader distribution than just seven days ago. Um, and again, like the regression model, this uses past admissions as well as past and forecast cases. So they're all using kind of slightly different bits of information, but nothing too complicated. Um, and then the final model is just a median ensemble of models one to three, um, which is just a way of kind of combining these different models into something which generally in other scenarios um, has been shown to be more robust. Um, and the way that these are combined is by saying that either the point or the interval forecasts are just the median of um, the forecasts for these individual models. So say for the, uh, the point forecast, it's just the median of the point forecasts 
for models one to three. Um, and just to note, so I said that the, um, the regression model and the convolution model um, both use information about cases. And kind of when you get to longer time horizons, you need to also be able to forecast what future COVID-19 cases will look like. Um, because otherwise you're limited by kind of up to where you can observe those, say up to the forecasting date. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of this, um, but there's lots of information in this um, paper on Welcome Open Research and on the group website, which I think I have at the end. Um, it uses a package called EpiNow2, um, which basically makes forecasts based on um, estimates of RT, the real-time reproduction number, and then a convolution from kind of infections um, to unobserved cases and then to reported cases. Um, but basically all you need to know is that we also make forecasts of cases into the future. Um, so this is what some of the forecasts look like. Um, so on the left is just one time, uh, one forecast date example for the four kind of main models, time series, regression, convolution, and median, and just showing the point and interval forecasts. And then on the right is just lots of different forecast dates, just showing the seven day ahead forecast. And basically you can see that there is kind of some variation between the models in what they think might happen, obviously because they're using different bits of information. So now we want to kind of be able to evaluate forecasts. And there's obviously lots of different ways that you can kind of measure how well forecasts do um, in kind of different ways. Um, and the main metric that we have looked at evaluating forecasts um, is called the interval score, which um, basically measures the accuracy. Well, the weighted interval score is the main thing, but it's based on the interval score, which measures, measures the accuracy of and the interval forecast um, and it's made of three parts. So the, it always includes a kind of penalty for the width of the interval. So the bigger your interval forecast, the bigger the penalty, um, but then also a possible forecast for a possible penalty if uh, the forecast either under predicts or over predicts what actually happens. Um, so basically, if, if the real data point lies outside of your interval forecast, you'll incur an additional penalty um, for basically getting it wrong. And then the weighted interval score allows you to combine lots of interval scores for different widths of um, interval forecasts. And we combine the kind of median forecast, 50% and 90% confident uh, prediction intervals. And then this allows us to compare the weighted interval score over um, kind of different forecast horizons, forecast dates, um, and locations. Um, so I think uh, we've still got time. Um, so if we look at the performance overall, just for a seven day ahead forecast, so we're looking at the average performance over all of the forecast dates and all of the locations. Um, kind of reassuringly, what we see is that all models can do better than that very simple baseline. So all models kind of use the information about the trajectory of admissions or about future cases to be able to do something better than saying the future looks like what we see today. Um, and that just basically means that they had a lower average weighted interval score. Um, and amongst all the models that we looked at, the median ensemble is the best model. It has the lowest weighted interval score. Um, and not only that, if we rank all of the models for each of the kind of over 2000 date location pairs that we looked at in the time period, um, we also find that the median ensemble is kind of most often ranked first or second. So on the right, um, kind of about 60%, over 60% of the time, the median ensemble is either rank one or two. So it's also, it's not only the best, but it's kind of most consistently the best model. Um, if we just look by forecast date, um, so now just taking the average performance over all locations, um, then 
we kind of see a slightly different pattern and we start seeing some differences between the models. So now only the median ensemble is better than the baseline for all dates. So in this, um, in this plot at the bottom, we have the, the weighted interval score, our kind of metric, and we can see that the, the weighted interval score over time for the median ensemble in pink is lower than the gray uh, line, which is the baseline model. Um, and not only is it kind of the only one that's always better than the baseline, but it's also the best model for most of the forecast dates. So the mean ensemble is really kind of doing consistently well in a lot of different kind of settings as the epidemic changes, as restrictions come in and out of place. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the biggest improvements compared to the baseline. So when there's a biggest difference between the gray and the pink uh, points and lines, it's just during periods of um, quite rapid change in admissions. So during November, when we were in um, a lockdown and admissions kind of decreased quite quickly in some places, as well as in January, when we went again into the third lockdown. And obviously during periods of rapid change, the baseline model does quite badly because there's some obvious trend that's happening, but the baseline just thinks it's just gonna carry on sort of straight out as it is. Um, and so my final uh, bit of results is looking at um, performance by location. So looking at each trust, each trust performance, um, but kind of averaged over all of the forecast dates that we looked at. Um, and kind of what we find is that performance is very variable. So each of the models kind of have some locations where they do very well and some locations where they don't do so well. Um, there's nothing that kind of is consistently uh, very, very good, um, at least amongst the models that we looked at. Um, most of the models outperform the baseline for the majority of trusts. So in this plot on the right, most of the points lie below the dashed line, which means that the, the weighted interval score of the model is lower than the weighted interval score of the baseline for that trust. Um, but there's obviously quite a lot of variation in kind of how often that happens. Um, the median ensemble model, again, had the kind of lowest and most consistent weighted interval scores. So kind of average of all of these points is the lowest and there's, there's not as much variation in the median ensemble as say for some of the other models. And um, so it's kind of, again, the most reliable model when you're considering all of these different scenarios. Um, and not shown here, but um, if we look at the rankings again of the models over all of the trusts, we see that the median ensemble is again, kind of first or second ranked model for most of the trusts. Um, so out of all of them, it's probably the best one to pick reliably. Um, and I think, that, yeah, that's all of the uh, results I've got to share here. Um, there's a sort of preprint on its way. Um, so kind of keep an eye out for that, or I'm happy to talk about um, this in any more detail with people now, either questions or um, offline sort of over coffee. Um, but thanks again for the opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, either take questions now or at the end. Thanks. Uh, so thank you for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we are uh, in the uh, limit of the time, so I'm going to leave the questions to the end of the session. Hopefully we have an interesting discussion at the end. Uh, and I'm going to go through the next speaker. So the next speaker is Delphine Torres. Delphine Torres is a full professor of mathematics at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Aveiro, uh, where is a coordinator of the Center for the Research and Development of Ma in Mathematics and Applications, and also the coordinator for the System and Control Group. He did uh, his bachelor in computer science engineering, his master's in optimization and control theory, uh, and his PhD in mathematics at uh, University of Aveiro. Uh, his main research area is calculus of variation and optimal control, optimization, and more recently, fractional derivatives and integrals, uh, dynamic equations on time scales or measure, measures chains, and of course, epidemiology. 
Uh, Delphi has written more than 400 scientific and pedagogical publications, including research papers in first class international journals, uh, refereed co uh, conference proceedings, chapters in books and uh, books. Uh, moreover, he has, uh, uh, is an editor of many high quality international journals. He has been a team leader and a member in several national and international research projects. And he has a strong ex experience in graduate and postgraduate student supervision and teaching in applied mathematics, both in Portugal and abroad. Uh, one of these recent projects that uh, Delphine has worked on is uh, a call from Fundação Ciência e Tecnologia, a recent call, Research for COVID-19. And today I think he's going to present some results on this project. So welcome, Delphine. It's a pleasure. The screen is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and so nice words. So now I will try to share my slides. So first of all, thank you to, to the invitation. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and to share with you some of our results. I think I am like Gabriela, so I'm a little tired of COVID, but I guess that all of us are, are tired of, the, of COVID. But it's really great to, to have this possibility to, to mention some of our work, uh, work of our PhD students, of our researchers. Uh, so I will try to present some of the work that uh, has been done in our research center in SIDMA at the University of Aveiro. So I would like to, to recall that, of course, this pandemic is a drama, but maybe we can try to, to find one or two things that are positive. So maybe one of them is that at least during the first uh, phase when uh, all people were in lockdown, uh, we begin to listen birds in our city, so pollution decreased. And I think maybe the second positive uh, aspect is that now people are more aware of the importance of science and, uh, and innovation and in mathematics also. Uh, so people now uh, understand better the, the importance of science. And this explains how it was possible to have a vaccine so fast. About the mathematics, and uh, I'm always impressed to see numbers. So here I restrict myself to this database of uh, Mats Kinet and only to, to research uh, work uh, that has COVID-19 in title. But even with such restrictive uh, search, uh, we are easily able to find uh, almost 650 papers. So I'm always impressed by the huge amount of mathematics that is being done uh, in one year, uh, in one year. So it's really impressive the, the amount of uh, work in mathematics that is uh, being done uh, related with, uh, with COVID. Uh, so now uh, I always like Mats Kinet, but now I'm getting more fun of Zentalblatt since uh, it is now open, open access, uh, open database. But one thing that is nice about uh, Mats Kinet is uh, affiliation. So I was also curious to see uh, the 650 uh, works uh, which ones are coming from uh, Portugal with the with institution Portugal. And uh, we are able to easily identify five, five works. And I was happy to see that four of them are um, from, from our research unit. So today I want to speak about some of these works, in particular uh, the work of our students, Faisal and Vairu, and also Zin Olsin, that are uh, students and are working here uh, with us. So I will begin with the, with the first paper that uh, it has been done here in our research unit. And in fact, it was one of the first, uh, so according with Mats Kinet, because in Mats Kinet, we can also see the, the works in chronological order, or if you prefer in anti-chronological, so on the top, you see the, the most recent. And this paper, it seems that it was uh, worldwide, the paper number eight to be published about uh, COVID. So at that time, um, we are speaking in January when we have this idea. In fact, in early February, um, so this is work of student Faisal, 
I am his supervisor and, uh, and a co-supervision at colleague Ivan Areia from Galicia, from University of Vigo. And Ivan visited us in February, I have here the dates, 11, 12 February. And at that time, we already have a preliminary version of, the, of this work. Um, of course, I'm, it took me some time to finish the paper, so it was submitted in March, and then it was published in June. So at that time, uh, when we begin to do this work, no one was speaking about COVID, so in January, February in Portugal, but there was already this news from Wuhan, so our uh, study was about the reality of, of Wuhan. So, uh, we, we, after discussing, so this was idea of Faisal, as I already mentioned. So this is, I would say, a very simple and uh, easy to understand model. So we divide, uh, it's a compartment model. So we divide people in susceptible, exposed, infected, then uh, people can, can, can die. So this is the fatality class. Uh, class. Uh, they can be hospitalized, they can recover, so it's a simple model. So what was here our main idea, what was our main contribution? In fact, it was this class that we call P, it was the class of super spreaders, what we call super spreaders. So at that time, uh, this was uh, quite a new idea. And recently, I saw, uh, in fact, many research papers uh, using the same idea of super spreaders. Uh, recently, uh, this year, uh, maybe one month ago, there was a paper uh, in uh, Nature where they are precisely discussing the role of, of super spreaders in, 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 uh, in infection in the, in the population. Uh, so we have done a, a mathematical study of this model. So, for example, we computed the basic reproduction number. Um, here, I, I always say this to my students, uh, so as a researcher and also uh, as a teacher, have the importance to, to nowadays to try to fight uh, against this crisis of replication of results. So, of course, as mathematicians, usually we publish our papers as preprints. We saw this already here in this session, so it's very important. And also, in, uh, Sophie mentioned uh, this open data, uh, she also mentioned this GitHub. Uh, so it's important uh, that the data is public. And uh, we also publish our code that we have uh, used using SageMap. So it's also open software. So this is available. And we try uh, that students understand the importance of replication of results and the open, open data and open software. So uh, very fast. So this model uh, showed to be uh, a useful model uh, to describe the reality of one in this case. So we are able to, to, to fit, let me say, uh, the, not only the confirmed the cases, but simultaneously also uh, the number of deaths. So the same model uh, describes well uh, different realities. Um, after this uh, work, uh, so the, it was pub published in June, as I, as I mentioned, uh, of course, in February, then March, we have the first cases in Portugal, and very fast, we were in lockdown, so uh, we were, of course, interested in the situation of Portugal, and also we have Spain, because uh, co-supervisor of Faisal is also Spanish, and in particular from Galicia. So we, we, uh, our natural question was, uh, the following. Is this model also a good model to describe uh, different realities in Portugal, in, in Spain? So we use uh, real data. But when we begin to discuss also things with uh, some doctors, uh, we understood that there was some problem with data, with delays. At, at least in Galicia, this was uh, completely clear. So in order to to deal with this question of delays of that and there were corrections. So we have this idea to do some average. Um, our first idea was to do average of that uh, of seven days, so by week, uh, as, as also was presented in the last talk, uh, so results by seven days. But then there was also some problems in weekends. So finally, we agree with doctors that five days, it will be a good, uh, good number to do average of five days. After we do this average in the data, for us, because as Paul mentioned, we also work with fractional order systems. 
So for us, it was natural to, so this is the same model, but the difference is that we put here this uh, fractional order derivative. So I, I didn't put here the definition, we are using the definition in the sense of Caputo, but what is important here to understand is that when alpha is equal to one, this is the usual derivative. So this is the same model that I mentioned already, but we have possibility to have derivatives of order zero point uh, whatever. So it's a real number. Um, it's a real number. But mathematical, this is a non-local operator. So this is the motivation because since this is a non-local operator, this is defined mathematically as an integral, we have this memory that we introduce after we do the average at five days. So uh, this was the only difference. And we try to understand if the model is good for Spain, for in particular for Galicia, also for Portugal. So here you, you can see some figures. The numbers are, so here we are in Galicia, so we are speaking about 400 people. Here we are in Spain, so the, it seems similar graph, but here it's 9,000 because we are speaking about Spain. And in Portugal is medium number, so here uh, Port Portuguese situation, so 900. So it was nice to see that the same model, uh, with in fact with the same, exactly the same parameters as we have done for, for China, for Wuhan, was also a good model to describe this uh, reality. So what was the difference, what, what we observed? So the model is exactly the same with the same parameters. The only difference to describe different realities of Galicia, Portugal and, and China was in fact the fractional order derivative. So uh, the best order for the derivative was one in the case, so classical model, as I show you, for the situation of one, but to have these good results for Portugal and Spain, uh, the, the order of the derivative, so the memory in some sense, was a different one. So here we have some memory. Um, I, can, I can read you some of our conjectures that we wrote in the beginning of June, uh, end of May. Uh, so the results obtained allow us to conjecture, it is written in the paper, that the strains and genomes uh, of the new coronavirus present in Spain and Portugal are different from those that initially reached, reached China. So we have this idea that maybe this difference in the order of the derivative was related with this fact. After this pioneer work of our student, Faisal, now there are a huge literature uh, about using fractional order models with different kind of operators. Uh, not only in Caputo sense, but also other, other non-local operators. And here I mentioned uh, two other works of our research group that are already published uh, recently in this year. So more or less at the same time and independently, we have another uh, student that now already finished. So Anna Pedro now is a postdoc researcher. Um, that also had the same ideas as, as many of us. So uh, the, the thesis of Ana Pedro was in a different subject. So uh, her thesis was about, uh, about um, uh, not about COVID, it was, uh, but what I want here to say is the, to remind, because now it became for us very common, this idea to put people in quarantine, quarantine. Okay. Uh, we saw countries in quarantine, big cities in quarantine, but before COVID, no one <laughs> discussed quarantine. This was really old fashioned. I remember when Ebola, there was some outbreak of Ebola some years ago in Africa, and uh, the politicians decided to put a small village in Africa in quarantine, and it was a lot of discussion about human rights. It was not correct to put force people in quarantine. Of course, COVID changed all of this. But what I want to say is that cholera, that was the subject of Anna Pedro in his PhD thesis, is one of the diseases that is still nowadays recommended by World Health Organization that uh, to put people in quarantine. So World Health Organization for people for, for cholera still recommends quarantine. So for, for Anna, uh, when the situation of COVID came, it was natural to think about a model where we have uh, people in quarantine. So this was done in March, in March. It was published later, of course. 
but the idea, of, uh, so it's a different model. Here we have quarantine, we don't have the super spreader, so it's another student, another idea, another people to, uh, thinking. Uh, we also have people so uh, susceptible, uh, symptomatic, infected, quarantine. Here, uh, we di distinguish between hospitalized and hospitalized in intensive care units and also uh, the death compartment. So it's also a very simple uh, system, a, a very simple model. And uh, again, so we proved that the, the, this model is well posed from a mathematical point of view, from a biological point of view. We compute equilibrium points, the basic reproduction number. Then we also try to fit uh, with the real data and we use public data from our data, Direção Geral de Saúde, Health, so public data. The results uh, show that the model is able to describe well the reality. So again, we have here simultaneously fitting the number uh, of infected and hospitalized. And uh, maybe some conclusions that uh, one can read from this paper, that uh, these conclusions were written in uh, also in end of May, beginning of June. Uh, our results show that at the end of the three emergent states declared in Portugal, the country begins 4th May uh, last year, a possible turning point situation where the number of new infected individuals can continue to decrease or in the opposite, if the number of contacts between infected and susceptible individuals increase, the Portuguese epidemiological situation can converge to an endemic equilibrium. So we wrote this in, in a, a time where people are already going out of home, end of, of lockdown. I remember that in Ju July, August, people went to ocean. So, but it was already able to see from our uh, investigations that it is possible to have an endemic situation. Uh, also to mention that um, there are still some open problems from a mathematical point of view. We, we are able to prove local stability, but we don't uh, prove global stability. We saw it numerically, but uh, we, we would like to have some mathematical proof of uh, this fact, but we were not able, so it's still uh, open uh, this question. Now, uh, a third student, uh, Osin, so he is doing the PhD also with us in our research center here in Aveiro, but he's from Morocco and with this lockdown situation, so he went to Morocco and of course he was also preoccupied and he began also to think about this uh, more related with the reality of Morocco. And uh, since I was also confined, we keep in touch, but he also uh, went in contact with a group in Casablanca that has a lot of experience um, in mathematical modeling. And uh, we have now some papers also published. And uh, one is not published yet, is a set uh, a long time ago, since 8 October, but we are still waiting. Um, so very fast, what was the idea of Zin and what we have done? So till now, our models were, let me say, dynamical systems. We are trying to understand the reality. Here, we already want to introduce some control measures. So we have some controls that here were modeled as piecewise functions because, we want, because the politics were changing uh, in Morocco and also changing in Portugal. Uh, there was lockdown, a state of emergence, then the end of state of emergence. So the, these controls, the, the <coughs> measures, are, are, are piecewise uh, functions. They are changing with time. So in, in, in case of Morocco, we have uh, one in situation from March 2 to March 10, so in Morocco, the first cases were also like in Portugal, were reported exactly in the same day, March 2. Then the different politics. And the model is also very simple. So here, uh, we, we don't consider all people susceptible, but only a subclass that we call vulnerable. This is related with, uh, then I can explain the, with the situation of Morocco. Then uh, we have a symptomatic, a people infected, symptomatic, asymptomatic. And then the people, different, uh, so benigne, we call it grave and critical situation. And then, uh, and then uh, recovered, and we assume that only people who get the COVID uh, uh, in critical form, that only this uh, can die. So it's a similar simple model, but a little different. Here it was also deterministic model. In a second paper, we also study a stochastic model and not with uh, and to deal with these delays 
we, we the other work with Faisal was using fractional order derivatives. Here we consider uh, delay systems. So we have differential equation with delays, uh, it appears here, tau two, um, and also with some Brownian motion. So it was a stochastic, a stochastic uh, uh, model. In a third paper, we decided to use the same model with delays and also with the stochastic effects, but to study a different uh, question. So here we were discussing in this paper the, the confinement. So it was after already in a different in a different period uh, of time. Just to finish, because I know that we are very short on time, let me mention that more or less at the same time. Uh, there was a call from FCT about projects of COVID, so it was in March, as far as I remember. And at least in the first call, Aveiro in mathematics, we were the only one to get a project uh, financed. Uh, so Christiana uh, had the idea to, to apply for this project. But here the idea was a little different. So I already Sorry. Systems, I already mentioned control systems with these control measures, but here we want to use optimal control theory. So we work in optimal control. And we will want to investigate the, the theory, what theory of optimal control can help us in fighting this. Uh, so this project uh, was led by Christiana. It was Christiana. I was part of, of the, with my student. <coughs> Sorry, Delphine, can you, can you hear me? Sorry? We, we are sorry to interrupt, but we are yeah. running out of time. 10 seconds, okay? Just okay, okay. we have this project that was leaded by, and I will not present nothing, of course, um, but I know that Christian is here. I just want to mention that he, 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 this project involved not only mathematicians, but also people from health, and also the colleagues from University of Vigo and University of Santiago de Compostela, that are mathematicians, uh, and also from physics. Um, so this was a multidisciplinary project. And at a later stage, also our colleague from France, Guillaume Cantan, also joined us. So I promise to finish. So about this project, you can see the, this paper publishing scientific reports, uh, and also this paper, uh, more mathematical oriented, publishing journal mathematical analysis and applications. So thanks again for the invitation. And um, if you have any question, uh, I'm here to try to, to answer you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Sorry to stop. My so, thank you, Delphine. Uh, it was a nice uh, uh, lot of, of, of different mathematical frameworks, theoretical frameworks used in to apply to this, this pandemic. Uh, so uh, we have no time for, for questions. We go through to the last uh, speaker. So to finish, to finish this parallel session, we have the presence of uh, Odo Dickman from the Mathematical Institute of Utrecht University. Uh, one of its uh, main contributors to this uh, field is the, the next generation operator concept for the computation of the basic reproduction number uh, together with Easterbeek and Metz in, in, in a famous paper that has over 4,000 citations. And I, I'm sure that everyone that works on this, uh, in this subject at some point uh, have read uh, or this, this, this paper. Uh, his interests in our mathematical population dynamics, modeling of structure, biological populations, including, of course, infectious disease dynamics and dynamical systems, in particular in infinite dimensional spaces. He has a vast list of publications in first-class international journals and also books. Perhaps the best known is Mathematical Epidemiology of Infectious Disease, another important uh, piece of information for all of those that want to enter this, this subject. Uh, he has, uh, has supervised over 20 PhD students, and I should say that despite his impressive CV, he is the most enchanting and humble person I've, I've known. Uh, once again, I, I thank you all though, for accepting my invitation, and uh, the screen is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Paula. Uh, it's a pleasure to take part in this uh, meeting, and it's also a great honor to be able to give here this uh, presentation which is uh, not so much about COVID, 
So for all of you who are tired of COVID, uh, relax. Now I want to show a little bit of the background of what in epidemiology are the general ideas. Um, and to do so, I, I in some sense go back to 1927, as I will explain later, because I want to introduce what I consider as a backbone of epidemiological models. And by backbone, I mean that a full-fledged model certainly needs all kinds of additions like heterogeneity, as Gabriel already discussed, and other various features that should be included. But this is like the, the core uh, of, the, of such models that I want to explain. And in that uh, formulation, there is a variable S that is the size of the susceptible population it can be a density or just a total number. And it depends on the time indicated by T. And it changes only due to one effect, which is the transmission of the infection. And so we have this first equation, the whole model actually consists of just two equations, but the first equation says that the, uh, the decrease in the susceptible population is due to transmission and transmission the incidence, the number of new cases per unit of time is simply the product of the force of infection, lambda of T and the size of the susceptible population. So then after this trivial first equation, we have to say, what is the force of infection? What is the constitutive equation for the force of infection? And here the idea is simply a common sense the force of infection is due to individuals but which were themselves infected earlier. And we use the variable tau to, decay, to denote how much earlier. So tau is the time on a clock uh, that for each individual starts at the very moment it becomes infected. So it's the time since infection. And then you say the force of infection is uh, made up of contributions by the individuals that were infected tau units of time ago. And you sum all the contributions. And so the one and only model ingredient is this function A of tau. And the A is the expected contribution to the force of infection of any individual tau units of time after it became itself infected. When I say in expected, I of course refer to some uh, stochastic process, some form of heterogeneity. Uh, and I will not specify it because this is a top-down approach where I uh, leave unspecified what is the background, but just to make it a little bit uh, easier to understand perhaps for you, let me give an example of a concrete example of how you could think of such an A. And that's related to the SEIR model that we have already seen a couple of times, where now at the individual level, you imagine that in the moment an individual becomes infected, it moves to the class denoted by capital E. So that's why we have the probability p, little p of e at zero is one. With certainty, you enter in the compartment of uh, exposed individuals. From there, with a certain rate gamma, you move to the class of the infected, infectious individuals. And while you are infectious, you are removed with a certain rate alpha to the removed class. So we have two parameters, gamma and alpha. And in this case, the A of tau is simply a multiple of the probability to be in this class of infectious individuals. So in some sense, uh, though in a very crude way, the, uh, the P of I and tau refers to the within host physiology. And then the multiplication parameter beta, it gives the contact intensity. So it's also a probability per unit of time of meeting people or rather the expected number of individuals that you that the infected individual will meet per unit of time. So again, there's a stochastic process, maybe it was also Poisson process underneath, but we will not uh, specify it in general. So that's the notion of A of tau. Now, what can you do with this kind of equation, this, this kind of model specified by the two equations? I want to deal with three topics. The first is initial growth. The second will be peak values, but I will postpone that. It will not be treated at the second uh, uh, position, but the third uh, is actually the final size. But let's first discuss initial growth. In that case, you uh, 
substitute in the constitutive equation for lambda of t, the uh, force of infection, I'm sorry, the force of infection times the susceptible population. But you say, well, in the initial situation, let's forget that the susceptible population is decreasing, that the fuel that the susceptibles form for the pathogen is decreasing due to its own influence. Let's keep it at capital N, the susceptible total population size. And that's linearization in the mathematical sense, but you just replace S by N, it's linearization. And then you get a linear renewal equation, a Volterra integral equation of convolution type, and it's translation invariant because the time T only enters as an argument of the lambda. And whenever you have an equation that is both translation invariant and linear, you should try exponential solution. So you, as an answer to put lambda of T is an exponential function, and then you can divide out e to the lambda t at both sides. And what you end up is an equation for the lambda that the lambda should satisfy in order that this uh, lambda of t is indeed a solution. And that equation is called the Euler-Lotka equation because Euler already in the uh, 18th century uh, formulated a variant of this in discrete time and Lotka then early in the 20th century uh, introduced it in the context of age-dependent population. Now, since A is non-negative, you can easily see that with only a minor condition on the tail behavior of A, you always have a unique real root, and that is called the Matusian parameter. And at the background now is a general theory of positive semi-groups, which in the finite dimensional case is related to peron frobenius theory, and in the infinite dimensional case to the krein rittmann theory, that you can show that e to the rt is indeed the asymptotic large time behavior of all solutions, all positive solutions, I should say, of this uh, linear renewal equation. There is another way of looking, as we have also seen in, in all the talks uh, so far, to look at uh, growth, namely in the generation perspective. And there we have this basic reproduction number R0, which is by definition the expected number of secondary cases per primary case. And in the context of this model, it's simply the product of this total population density n times the integral. So you integrate all contributions over all times, a of tau, the integral of a of tau. And variance of this R0, the zero really refers to the virgin population. So you, you think of a pathogen that is introduced in a population, in a host population that has not suffered from disease so far. But we have seen in uh, daily newspaper reports, a version of this uh, reproduction number updated to the present situation. So where it's like an eff effective population reproduction number uh, rather than a basic reproduction. Now, fortunately, uh, it's easy to check that the sign of the Matusian parameter is the same as sign of R naught minus one. So whether we have growth or decline is uh, the same in both the, the continuous time formulation where you have the Matusian parameter and the discrete generation way of looking at it where you have the R naught. When, like in the case of COVID, we have a newly emerging disease, by looking at data, you can actually uh, see this exponential rise, and you can try to estimate the Malthusian parameter from the data. What you would like to know is the R0, because in view of control, which is often like a multiplicative uh, effect on the A of tau, you know, or you at least can, can try to, maybe I should say guesstimate, the effect of control on the R0, and it's far harder and in fact, impossible to immediately see its effect on the R. So you want to relate the R to the R naught, but the uh, Euler-Lotka equation is just in some sense a one dimensional constraint on the function A of tau, if you consider R as known. So it does not at all specify the shape of the A, it's only specifying some overall magnitude of the A. And so we need to really make this work, additional information. And here things like the uh, generation time, so the time between one, the primary case and the secondary case, 
or uh, it, it, as a kind of uh, a proxy of it, the serial time, the time between the symptoms of the primary case and symptoms of the secondary case, that is the kind of information, including, of course, also uh, situation about uh, information about the within host dynamics of the virus within the host. It's a difficult problem in general. Now I skip for the moment peaks and go to outbreak size. There, the question is what fraction will ultimately be infected? And now we take this first equation that we had where we had the, uh, the incidence S minus the derivative of S and we divide by S and at the uh, we write the lambda of t as an integral of the incident, but now the incident is written as minus the s dots. And then you get the equation that is written here, the first one. And you see that both sides are a time derivative. And so you can integrate and you get the logarithm of the small s and the small s is just the capital S, but now as a fraction, so divided by the capital N. And you get a simple nonlinear renewal equation. And since S is a monotone function, you can easily take the limit and then you get the final size equation that uh, expresses a relationship between the fraction S infinity that is not infected. So the final size is one minus S infinity and R not. And so here, the remarkable feature is that this is completely independent of the shape of the function A, only this complete the total magnitude in the sense of R naught matters, not the shape of A for the final size. And if you plot as one minus S infinity as a function of R naught, you get the curve that is depicted here. And from it, you can easily see that if you have like in the case of COVID and R naught that is somewhere between two, two and three, you get that about 70 or 80% of the population gets infected. So that's another reason why people are interested in or not. One is from a control perspective, but the other reason is that it's also uh, good to know the final size. Now there is a probabilistic interpretation of the final size equation where you say S infinity is the probability to escape after the outbreak is over. And this is e to the minus of the total force of infection. And the total force of infection is one minus S infinity times N. So that is the total number of individuals that get infected times this integral of A. And so this is like a consistency equation uh, between S infinity and this A. What I have completely ignored so far is that uh, we have demographic stochasticity that actually uh, a population size cannot be really counted in real numbers. It should be in integers. And if you switch to a description where you have uh, a capital uh, N as a, as, a, as a number, then you may actually do experiments where you uh, simulate. And here, of course, the, and, and this is hidden in this graph, and I, this graph is just a, a symbolic uh, presentation, but the, the true nature of the stochastic process underlying A of tall matters. But I want just to use this to point out one thing, that you see this little bit of mass in the left corner. And by the way, the, the graph is just a histogram of the number of realizations and then the fraction that uh, became uh, infected in, uh, or uh, yeah, that became infected in each realization. So it can happen that when you start the epidemic with just one case, that actually, despite the fact that R0 is bigger than one, so despite the potential of growth, the whole epidemic dies out in the initial phase. And that is the reason for this little bit of mass in the left corner. But if conditional on a major outbreak taking place, you will find some distribution around the mean. And the, re the mean is exactly this one minus S infinity. That is the mean in the limit when you let the po total population size go to infinity. So there is in this context in epidemic models, both a law of large numbers that gives you the mean, but also a, a central limit theorem that gives you that the, uh, in the limit, the uh, distribution around this mean is more and more like a, uh, a normal distribution. There's a certain variance that relates to the square root of it. Now, most of what I've said so far, and 
uh, is, is really already contained in this famous paper by Kermak and McHenrich from 1927. The only thing I've done is I have kind of modernized the treatment of the linearization, but that's all. This paper is hugely uh, successful. It has more than 8,000 citations on Google Scholar. And if you look at the website of the publisher, it has more than 48,000 downloads, but I claim nobody reads it. And that's really an annoying feature in my opinion. Why do, do people not read it? Well, because, or how do I know that they don't read it? Well, that is because whenever you see a reference to this paper, then as a rule, people say, oh, Kermit McKendrick introduced the SIR compartmental model that is written here as three ODEs, and which is the, the, the face plane is depicted in a little graph. Now that special case only is really a special case because it, comes, it uh, is related to A of tau that is beta times E to the minus alpha tau, that's all. And in the paper, there is this general version with the A of tau, but nobody, or well, of course, there are some people that, that find it, but almost nobody really discovers it. And let me mention, uh, we have seen many extended SERR models uh, in the foregoing talks. You can actually show that a generalization of the formula for A of tau that I just showed where you allow U and V to be factors and H to be an N by N matrix, that leads to the uh, compartmental models that we have seen. So they all are covered, all these extended SER, our models are covered by uh, various forms of A of tau. The only thing that you should not allow is to uh, allow return to the susceptible class. So you cannot uh, allow models where in this manner, where you lose your susceptibility, where you regain susceptibility after a while. Let me, let me uh, just uh, concerning this uh, say, three more words about why I think that people don't uh, realize that the, this general model is in Kermak and McKendrick. I think, first of all, renewal equations are not as familiar as ordinary differential equations. So people, it is a, renewal equations are a form of delay equations, but people are simply not familiar with it. So it's easy and it's, it's uh, um, people are enticed to, to forget about uh, the renewal equations. Secondly, a drawback of renewal equations is that there are no good numerical tools immediately available, user-friendly tools, I would say, as there are for ODEs. And, and finally, the A of tau, of course, is like an infinite dimensional parameter. People prefer uh, finite many parameters. So lead, let me, I will return to this uh, in a moment, but let me now first take up the issue of heterogeneity, the fact that not uh, that not all individuals are exact, exactly the same as already discussed by uh, Gabriela. But here I want to, um, to, to first uh, illustrate it by a very obvious case, like a malaria model where you have a factor, think of a mosquito and the host, think of humans. And you have infection from going from the factor to the host and from the host to the factor. And in that case, of course, you don't have a next generation number immediately, but you have a next generation matrix that involves two uh, numbers. And you want some way to get an average out of these two numbers, because we prefer, of course, to have uh, a summary in one number rather than in two numbers. And here, the way to do that is to define the reproduction ratio as the spectral radius of the matrix. And you can think about this in terms of generation dynamics, and you have to think in terms of prone frobenius theory, where you have convergence of the distribution to the eigenvector corresponding to the dominant eigenvalue, and the dominant eigenvalue is exactly the spectral radius. So again, prone frobenius is at the background of this definition. Now, this was for a finite dimensional kind of heterogeneity. In general, it can be infinite dimensional as Gabriela already uh, discussed. And then we have an operator. So we have an operator that uh, maps the distribution with respect to a trait called X. 
in one generation, and this distribution is described by phi of x, to the generation, to the distribution in the next generation. And here we have now a function a that does not depend just on tau, but it depends on both the trait of the one that is the primary case, and that is the y variable here, and the one that is the secondary case, and that is the x variable here. So you have a kernel that depends on three variables, but like in the case of um, uh, without heterogeneity, you can integrate with respect to the tau. So you get a kernel with respect with two variables, x and y. And in general, uh, of course, this is a, a difficult problem to find the eigenvalues, but it is quite simple if we have, uh, and the motivation for this is that X is like the level of sexual activity. And now you should think of HIV and AIDS as the motivating example. And indeed, this kind of model was used a lot uh, in the 80s of the last century when uh, IF was uh, 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 the biggest issue in epidemiology. And then, uh, as Gabriela also uh, mentioned, if you have uh, that, that case that uh, A is like a function of tau called uh, a wiggle of tau times x and times y. So you have a, a, a multiplication of the uh, influence of x and y on the A a product, and you have to scale it to, uh, to, to normalize it then actually you have an operator with a one dimensional range. So there is only one, um, one eigenvalue and it's easy to compute it. And you get this explicit expression for the, uh, the one eigenvalue. So that is the R naught. And the key point is that uh, this uh, involves the second moment. And so you can write it as the mean because we divide also by the mean uh, the whole thing is the mean plus the variance over the mean. And the, the key point is that this variance has a big impact on the R0. And this was really in the context of HIV and AIDS, a major insight that if we have, uh, like in, in a very active homosexual communities, a lot of variation in how active people are, you should not simply take the mean. That gives a complete misguided uh, estimate for the R0, you should really take the variance into account. So that was a major uh, insight at that time. Let me also set, mention that this one dimensional character is not just uh, there for the, um, uh, to compute the R0. In fact, you can, uh, for the force of infection uh, in the linearization, uh, as I have given it here, uh, get a one dimensional uh, renewal equation. So you can reduce the, the infinite dimensional renew renewal equation to a one dimensional renewal equation. Now I mentioned that uh, we have to deal with renewal equations which are unfamiliar and that there are no numerical tools uh, that are user friendly immediately available. In March last year, in March 2020, I got an email from Matthias Preck, the former director of Oberwolfach, uh, who inquired, uh, uh, he's a pure mathematician, but he became interested because of the COVID epidemic in, in epidemic models. And he uh, knew me from meetings over there. And he asked me, started asking me some questions about SIR models and et cetera. And uh, I tried to convince him to use the uh, kermit mckendrick uh, type formulation and then at some point he started to use discrete time formulations where he used the data, which on a daily basis gave the incident. And he wanted to make a model formulation that related directly to the data. So I started looking in the uh, epidemic literature for the discrete time version of Kermit McKendrick general model and couldn't find it. So therefore I sat down and derived it myself and it, quite trivial, I would say, but there's one thing one should keep in mind, one should never, for this kind of uh, models as the Kermit McKendrick model, use the, uh, the, the discretization of the differential in terms of the difference quotient. Instead, you should integrate the differential equation and then discretize in some sense. And uh, that amounts to the 
the uh, way of going from the upper equation to the equation down one level, where you replace the integral by a sum and where you replace the function a of tau by, and let's assume that the a of tau has compact support, so you uh, replace it by finitely many coefficients a of, core, a of k. And of course, uh, this is not the way to do computations. You should not work with this. For the theory, this higher order recurrence relation for a scalar variable is very handy, but to do computations, you should write it as a first order system. And we elaborated this uh, in, a, in a joint work with Hans Ottmer, Bob Planquet, and Martin Bootsma, and it has been just accepted uh, for publication in PNAS. And our main uh, advocating, uh, our main message in this paper is that, uh, uh, first of all, it's, it's nice to, to have a time step that relates exactly between the interval between data points. So that's the, the point of view of Matthias Kreck, I would say. It's very good that these parameters, these A of K, that they relate directly to observational data, either this uh, serial interval type of data or whatever a virologist can tell you about uh, the virus load in, in the human host. Also to control measures, like if you have a, uh, both asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals and symptomatic individuals have a certain probability to be uh, noticed at uh, day K after they became infected and then put into quarantine, you can put all that kind of information directly in, this pay, in these uh, parameters A of K because they are, like I said uh, repeatedly, they are expected values with respect to this kind of stochastic process of either being found by uh, uh, showing symptoms or not. And you don't have, as you have to do when you do SEIR, you don't have to make observations, I'm sorry, you don't have to make uh, assumptions concerning uh, the way these uh, stochastic variables are distributed, which is always like this exponential type of distribution uh, in the case of compartmental models. Then you can ask, does it matter to have other distributions than these exponential distributions or gamma distributions or whatever? And my answer is yes, because with this discrete version that you get by uh, discretizing, by, by using the first order system, you can easily do cal calculations. And we find that the peak size can be as much as 10% higher if you have fix, fixed duration of the latent and the infectious period than when you have these exponentially distributed. So that is with a certain gauging where we have both the are not the same the Malthusian parameter the same and the mean length of the latent, the, the uh, exposed period the same. And then you can still have like 10% difference in peak size. So for peak size, I would say the shape of A does matter. So to summarize, if we have these three issues, uh, initial growth, then the shape of A matters, final size, the, a of, the shape of A does not matter, but for peak size, it does matter. Now, these are all models where we have only an outbreak, so we ignore population dynamics. It is also in the, uh, it's actually in the ODE context, not so very easy to have uh, population dynamics incorporated when you have a general survival function that is the script of F of A here. It is easy when you have a death rate fixed death rate mu, so when the survival function is an exponential function again, but in general it's not so easy. So here I look at the situation where uh, per unit of time there is a capital B number of new individuals added to the population, so the age distribution in the population is B times the uh, script F of A, and when we do have also an, an uh, infectious disease then the susceptibles as a function of time and age are obtained from the endless T or H by just multiplying by this exponential function where you integrate over the force of infection from the time T minus H at which you were born, because if at time T you have H A, you were born at time T minus H and you integrate up till the present time T. And the incidence here, I assume is lambda of T 
times uh, the integral of S. So here I don't incorporate any H dependence in the contact, which in general you should do, of course, but this is like, the, again, a homogeneous version. And the remarkable thing is then you can still get in this generality a scalar nonlinear renewal equation for lambda of t, which, however, is not so easy to analyze as we explain in this uh, paper that I mentioned here. So there's lots of topics that I have not really uh, time to discuss. One of them is spatial spread, where you have things like traveling waves, where you have things like the asymptotic speed of propagation. It's a very interesting topic. I, I think uh, very relevant and for in particular also uh, diseases in agriculture, where you have to think of the spatial domain as a field of corn in the American Midwest, which can be an enormous field and where some disease spreads like a, like a traveling wave. Also what I skipped is contact structure. I mentioned that in this uh, age structured model, I don't take uh, uh, age into account when it comes to contact, but of course I should. And there's lots of uh, 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 empirical work also on uh, age dependent in contact matrices. Another aspect of context is that um, in this uh, sexual transmitted uh, disease model that I mentioned, we, we took activity as influencing contact, but not uh, like in some sense, all relations were instantaneous. There were no lasting relationships. When you have lasting relationships, you should work with networks where people are linked, so people are the edges and uh, the links uh, connect the edges and you get networks. And there's lots of literature on that, which is very interesting. Then I skipped waning immunity. I skipped the effect of vaccination. I mentioned within host dynamics. Uh, and I think actually this is something that, uh, that deserves a lot of attention for the future where rather than having this silly SEIR description of what is going on within a, a host, you should really model the immune system of a host in its struggle with the pathogen and try to build that into epidemiological models where you look at uh, transmission at the population level. A very important topic because it is a, a threat uh, for society in general is the antibiotic resistance uh, of many bacteria that especially in hospitals uh, really are a danger uh, for all of us. And antibiotic resistance relates, of course, to the evolution of virulence. We also see now with COVID that the various uh, variants that by mutation arise can take over if they are in some sense more virulent. And this too is a very important topic in a, a mathematical theory of infectious diseases of which I had no time uh, to speak about. Let me make some concluding remarks. Uh, it's um, quite a while ago, ago now that the World Health Organization said, okay, so now malaria is almost dealt with. There's lots of diseases we can treat, uh, infectious diseases. So uh, let's focus on cardiovascular diseases. Let's focus on cancer because these are the, the ones important for the future. And by now we know that this is not true, that especially related to this, what I call the evolution of virulence, that the pathogens hit back. Malaria is back, TB is back. Uh, we have had HIV as a newly emerging disease. Now, of course, we have COVID that makes it almost redundant to mention this point at all. Also antibiotic resistance is a, is a big threat. And not just humans, you should also think of all the livestock diseases that are very important for society and also for plants. We are in like a, um, uh, a, an effort to con continuously improve our uh, material which, which we use to, uh, to produce agriculture uh, because they are vulnerable to diseases and, and we, uh, we lose if we don't uh, we are in a, in a war race, in a sense, uh, with the pathogen. Then a general remark is that on the one hand, you have mathematics, which can be quite pure. On the other hand, you have public health, which can be very concrete and which is indeed um, uh, 
practical and, and should control things. And there is a continuum in between. And this continuum is made out of chains of people, often just pairs of people that share a common a language and that can talk to each other. And I think it's important that we allow uh, for mathematics to have these contacts to go all the way to public health by things that become increasingly farther removed from the pure mathematics and increasingly more con concrete. And the inspiration should really go both ways. And I think I stop here and thank you for your attention. Obrigado. Thank you, Odo, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, we still don't have any questions in, in the in the uh, in the board, but I, I suggest a round of comments uh, through the, the all speakers and perhaps some questions between us, and to allow some time for people to intervene. Uh, I think that we we made a, a nice. Uh, nice overview of, of different aspects of, of the, the, the role of mathematics in this, in this field and uh, the different challenges that we are facing. Um, so I, I, I'll start by, by, by Gabriela. Do you want some, to, to, to do some comments and maybe ask question to the other speakers? Uh, yeah, I would like just to to make a comment or question to Odo, something that caught my attention because in, in, in the way it related to the framework I was presenting for heterogeneity. So, so uh, you you mentioned that the R zero the formula for R zero the expression for R zero it involves the second moment of the distribution when you have heterogeneity in connectivity and that was noticed uh, a few decades ago and and, uh, mm -hmm. and and attracted a lot of attention to investigate that that th those distributions in contacts in contact networks because it affected R zero so much. In the, in, in the heterogeneous susceptibility model, you don't have that second moment appearing in the formula of R0. You just have the, 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 the mean susceptibility uh, uh, appearing. Still, I think the importance of that kind of heterogeneity is just as great as the importance of heterogeneity in connectivity in the way it affects the uh, other model outcomes. And, and I, I wonder if it, you know, so I've been wondering this for some time, if, if it had been um, uh, in a way uh, relegated to second importance comparing with heterogeneity in contacts because it doesn't affect R0 explicitly as a formula because the way it happens is that what I what, what I'm using both models I using heterogeneous susceptibility and heterogeneous connectivity I fit those two to data to the time series of that and then I estimate the R0 in one case and the other I estimate roughly the same value of R0 in both cases because I guess the beta compensates the transmission, the transmission coefficient beta compensates for the presence or absence of that second moment. So in the end, you get, uh, when, when, you, when you simulate the model forward, like you, you make projections, you get similar second waves and third waves. You have similar dynamics forward. Uh, so I, I, I was just curious, what's your, uh, what's your, f your opinion, what's your view about this? Okay, that's a, that's a very nice question, because like two weeks ago, I would probably have answered, oh, I don't know. Uh, but last week, I was actually in a small meeting in Oberwolfach, uh, somewhat inspired by COVID. And I heard talk, two talks. One was by Frank Uliger, and the other was by Nigel Goldenfeld. And uh, both of them discuss exactly this, this impact of heterogeneity on the full dynamics and emphasize that it is very, uh, very important uh, for, for uh, future waves and, and uh, so aspects of dynamics beyond 
this introduction uh, phase. And uh, uh, I have two papers and uh, I haven't read them in detail yet, but I think they deserve much attention. And uh, so I, uh, I fully agree with you that uh, this is a, a topic to explore in more detail uh, and it, it, it is worth to do that. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, I don't know if, that, if Sophie, you want to comment or? Um, yeah, I had a question for um, Gabriella. Um, so obviously like one of the hard things about um, modeling I think as you touched on and kind of as I think other people mentioned one of the hard things is kind of including these quite big behavioral changes that we've seen either that have kind of been implemented as restrictions or just people's kind of like how they've adapted to um, kind of the risk and change their contact patterns um, and I know in a lot of other pieces of work people have tried to somehow it's quite a hard thing to measure, but people have kind of tried to incorporate this by looking at changes in like different mobility metrics. Um, I know that like Google and Apple mobility data is kind of available. And I wondered whether um, in your model where you kind of have this CT function kind of changing over time, whether you looked at that kind of compared to some of these mobility metrics or whether you basically whether you'd looked at kind of comparing those, because I know they're me measuring slightly different things, but of perhaps mobility has been used as a, a best proxy for how contact has changed over time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we, the way we try to formulate it, we try to define a shape that it's uh, kind of generally, uh, agreeable with so so we so we assume that that phase of uh, contacts go down they are low during lockdown and we impose those dates of lockdown this is imposed in our shape so and then we allow it to go up uh, uh, allow contacts to go up again and then we impose again later the second and, and third lockdowns we impose those dates but it's totally agnostic about what exactly made those contacts go down. And, and we, we, we want our algorithm to estimate the magnitude of that reduction in contacts um, and, and, and the slope of that going up phase and slope of the going down phase. So it, it just seemed uh, just the most naive, the most simplistic way we could do it. And, so we didn't use any data other than the dates of the lockdowns. And then, of course, we look, we're curious about how this compared with what people are measuring. And we found that uh, that phase of contact, of lifting measures, of, of, of con contacts, re contacts increasing again after the first lockdown, we found that to be closer uh, to, 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 yeah, to be, to be, Let's say in the first two months after after uh, lifting the first lockdown, first uh, th that was well, that's when that was when we compared it to Google Mobility data. Um, our the estimates we have now they are more similar to um, the stringency index that that in the that indicator that the Oxford University developed. So it's almost flat. We we find that. The, the contacts didn't really increase very much in the first two months after lifting the first lockdown. So I think people, so, so that this would be June, July last year. So during June, July last year, we find, we find almost zero slope for, for what we allow contacts to go up as much as the algorithm wants, we don't put a limit. It can go, it could be virtually back to one very fast. We don't impose any constraints on that. But we find the algorithm is, is telling us that it just wants to continue flat. It just wants to continue at the same level of contacts as during lockdown. Um, 
and and this is a correction from the version of the paper the, the, that we released a year ago that we also was uh, discussed a lot uh, um, in, in by by many people and and some people were 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 skeptical that at the time we were using a slope that was that was uh, motivated by google mobility data so we, uh, we imposed a fixed slope. We, we were doing it a bit differently a year ago. We were imposing a fixed slope and now we allow the algorithm to estimate the slope and it just doesn't want to have a slope. It wants to be flat. It, it, it's a bit difficult to, in, to, to interpret that uh, very, uh, very strictly because that, that C of T in a way, it also, it, it also accounts for viral evolution and seasonality, it's just everything. I, I just mentioned contacts for simplicity because I only have a short uh, short slot. But, but in, in, in fact, if, if you have seasonality, seasonality increasing transmission in the autumn and winter, that's also in that C of T because we don't have anything else allowing for that. So it must be captured by that C of T as well. Yeah, thanks for asking. It was, was, it was discussed a lot last, last summer. So we, we now have a question from the audience. Uh, Fabio Chaloup, uh, he asks, how could one introduce variants and especially competition between variants in others models? Uh -huh. uh, the, the difficulty is cross immunity. The difficulty is a modeling. Uh, so if, if you come up with a, uh, a, a nice model, uh, the bookkeeping is not the problem, I think. It is really, uh, you, you, so you would have uh, a, a type to the pathogen, you would have um, uh, various functions A, uh, but the, the, the great difficulty is uh, how do you really prescribe the immunity? So if someone is already infected and probably the infection is over, with one type, uh, what is the probability that it is then again infected by another type um, and, and so on. So that's the main, uh, main problem. Maybe if I can add uh, to that, then if, if you also have different variants with different, having different transmissibility or having the possibility of having different transmissibility, mm -hmm. then you, get, you can get confusion between what is cross immunity and what is modified transmissibility, uh, uh, variant specific transmissibility. So it can get difficult, as you say, because of estimating those, estimating sure. those yes. parameters. So uh, I'll go to Delphine. Do you have any questions for the other speakers or comments? Maybe uh, just a very short uh, question to each one of the uh, speakers. So for Gabriella, just curiosity, because I'm not um, used to these uh, models with uh, individual variation. So when we see in this equation S dot uh, uh, with respect to X, this was derivative with respect to time or it was derivative with respect to X? to time. There's no derivative with respect to X. So in fact, they are not, uh, you know, formally, they are not uh, PDEs. They are just all, all the just infinite ODE systems. Understand. Thank you very much. Yeah. So for Sophie, just also curiosity. So when you present your results, uh, I think it was seven days. Uh, so the, some plot, I noticed that you do some rescaling. So this was uh, can you please tell what was the reason to do this rescaling? Um, so the reason that we rescale the um, the weighted interval score is that basically the kind of size of that will scale with how many admissions a trust has or a location. So if you kind of just look at the raw average weighted interval scores, it will kind of skew towards whichever kind of places or times had the most admissions but if you want to kind of look at which places are consistent uh, uh, performing best sorry um in a way that kind of treats each of them fairly so i want to treat maybe perhaps small trusts in the same way as i treat big trusts then you you basically have to do some rescaling so um kind of pairwise looking at which models do better um and then kind of taking a, an average in some way. 
and that, and that basically means that you can look at say kind of all forecast dates somehow in the same way um even though obviously admissions in early October were very different to how many admissions we had in January. Um, so there's, um, I mean, there's some more details in the paper, but yeah, you, you basically do kind of a pairwise comparison of, of each of the things. And so you have lots of pairwise comparisons, like a ratio you basically do for all of them. And then you take the geometric mean and that kind of gives you a, a rescaled weighted interval score that doesn't depend on how many admissions there are. Mm -hmm. So about our uh, last uh, talk, I was uh, very, very happy with this message that uh, you told us that uh, we should first integrate and then discretize. I think this is a very nice message, but I would like to ask, so because when we discretize systems, I know that there is always many ways to do this discretization. Uh, so, so, in your opinion, this is uh, the really the good way to do it, yes? First, we need to integrate, and then... and then uh, Can you please just comment a little on this? Uh, well, point? so, uh, I think one way to illustrate it is, uh, think of the, the uh, ordinary SIR model, where you have these curves that are uh, constant total population size. Mm -hmm. And if you discretize uh, without uh, care, then uh, you lose this uh, invariance of the total population size. And then you can accumulate errors. That's one thing. Uh, in fact, uh, since the discretized version doesn't have a proper interpretation as a stochastic system, uh, you can have that you lose positivity. Of course, this doesn't happen if you make very small steps uh, so that um, the probability that something happens in this step is, is very low, then there is no risk. But if you make a, a little bit too big discretization step, you can actually get numbers that become negative, whereas the interpretation requires them to be positive. So there are various drawbacks uh, associated with uh, uh, just discretizing the uh, ordinary differential equations. In contrast, if you first do the integration, and, and that's why I like to present the model the way I did, then you really have an interpretation. It is still a model of an epidemic process from the very beginning with a discrete time step rather than a discretized version of a continuous time model. So it really has the interpretation of the model so you can think of every ingredient every every uh, relationship as a um, as related to the model and for instance if you um, so there's this very simple final size equation if you do the what I consider the wrong way of discretizing the model uh, it, it's very hard to to find that relationship for the maybe impossible I mean uh, probably it is impossible to find that relationship because you lost the the invariance of the total population. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. We are uh, at the end of, the of our time. I, I would like to uh, uh, give the, the, the word again to all, to, to, to be fair to all. I don't know if you have comments or questions to the, the other speakers. Uh, no, not really. I enjoyed uh, all talks, but uh, I must admit uh, when I'm uh, waiting for myself to speak, I always have a difficulty to uh, be so attentive to come up with questions. So no, 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 I'm sorry. No questions, but I enjoyed it. Okay, so thank again for uh, uh, your presentations. It, I think it was a very uh, good uh, parallel session. I'm very happy with the, the final result. And thank uh, all the participants also to, to, to attend this session. And uh, maybe you can send questions and uh, uh, learn a little bit more uh, uh, of this field by sending uh, an email to the participant, to the, the speakers and read some of the beautiful results they have presented. So thanks again and enjoy the, the rest of the meeting and well, thank you thanks for organizing this. Organization. Okay. Yes, thanks a lot. So, thank you very much, Carla.
You're welcome. So bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.